This is the first video of a series I'm starting of recommended books. And the first book I'm recommending is called Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. I'm going to read you a little snippet from the sleeve here that helps uh, describe the point or the purpose of the book. Why are homeless people sleeping on the sidewalks of New York in the winter? When the abandoned apartment buildings in the city have four times as many dwelling units as there are homeless people in the city. Why did Russians have to import food to feed people in Moscow when Russia itself had vast amounts of some of the richest farmland in Europe within easy driving distance? Why did unemployment reach 25% and American corporations as a whole operate in the red for two years in a row during the Great Depression of the 1930s? All of these very different but equally puzzling and needless tragedies grew out of a failure to understand and apply basic economic principles. Explaining these principles for the general public in plain English with neither graphs nor equations nor jargon is the goal and the achievement of Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. Yeah, this is a great book. It really is. Uh, I haven't read this book in 8 to 10 years, so I'm actually going to start rereading it right now and what I'll do is I'll give you a little taste of the book by starting from the beginning we'll start at chapter one page one what is economics some basic principles of economics apply in many different kinds of economies capitalist socialist feudal or whatever and among a wide variety of peoples cultures and governments policies which led to rising price levels under Alexander the Great have led to rising price levels in America thousands of years later. Rent control laws have led to a very similar set of consequences in Hong Kong, Stockholm, Melbourne, and New York. So have similar agricultural policies in India and the European Union countries. Differences in economic practices from one country to another are also revealing. There were economic reasons why manufacturing enterprises in the days of the Soviet Union kept almost enough inventory on hand to last a year, while inventories of supplies in some Japanese companies like Toyota are only enough to last a matter of hours. With new parts and equipment arriving at the factory at various times during the day to be installed immediately on cars as they are being assembled. Economics is more than a way to see patterns or to unravel puzzling anomalies. Its fundamental concern is with the material standard of living of society as a whole and how that is affected by particular decisions made by individuals and institutions. Yowza! One of the ways of doing this is to look at economic policies and economic systems in terms of the incentives they create rather than simply the goals they pursue. This means that, turning the page... Consequences matter more than intentions, and not just the immediate consequences, but also the longer-run repercussions of decisions, policies, and institutions. Virtually everyone agrees on the importance of economics, but there is far less agreement on just what economics is. Among the many misconceptions of economics is that it is something that tells you how to make money or run a business or predict the ups and downs of the stock market. But economics is not personal finance or business administration. And predicting the ups and downs of the stock market has yet to be reduced to a set of dependable principles. Yee. To know what economics is, we must first know what an economy is. Perhaps most of us think of an economy as a system for the production and distribution of goods and services we use in everyday life. That is true as far as it goes, but it does not go far enough. No! The Garden of Eden was a system for the production and distribution of goods and services. But it was not an economy, because everything was available in unlimited abundance. Without scarcity, there is no need to economize and therefore no economics. A distinguished British economist named Lionel Robbins gave the classic definition of economics. Economics is the study and the use of scarce resources which have alternative uses. In other words, economics studies the consequences of the decisions that are made about the use of land, labor, 
capital, and other resources that go into producing the volume of output which determines a country's standard of living. Those decisions and their consequences can be more important than the resources themselves. For there are poor countries with rich natural... Re- now listen to this shit. Where the fuck am I? I lost my place. <clears throat> Those decisions and their consequences can be more important than the resources themselves. For there are poor countries with rich natural resources, and countries like Japan and Switzerland with relatively few natural resources but high standards of living. The values of natural resources per capita in Uruguay, 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 and Venezuela are several times what they are in Japan and Switzerland, but income per capita in Japan and Switzerland is about double that of Uruguay. The decisions that influence such outcomes are not only the decisions of individuals or industrial or agricultural enterprises or the policies of government. Among the major decisions affecting economic outcomes are decisions about what kinds of enduring institutions a society has for making those decisions. What kind of economic system operating in what kind of legal system and controlled by what kind of political system? It is crucial to keep in mind at all times that the resources being used are both scarce and have alternative uses. Dun, dun, dun. What does scarce mean? What does scarce mean? What does scarce mean? What does it means that what everybody wants adds up to no more than there is. This may seem like a simple thing, but its implications are often are often grossly misunderstood, even by highly educated people. For example, a feature article in the New York Times laid out the economic woes and worries of middle class Americans, one of the most affluent groups of human beings ever to inhabit this planet. Although this story included a picture of a middle-class American family in their own swimming pool, the main headline read, The American Middle Just Getting By. Other headings in the article included, Wishes Deferred and Plans Unmet, Goals That Remain Just Out of Sight, Dogged Saving and Some Luxuries. In short, middle-class American desires exceed what they can comfortably afford, even though what they already have would be considered unbelievable prosperity by people in many other countries around the world, or even by earlier generations of Americans. Yet both they and the reporter regard them as just getting by, and a Harvard sociologist was quoted as saying, how budget-constrained these people really are. But it is not something as man-made as a budget which constrains them. Reality constrains them. (laughs) There has never been enough to satisfy everyone completely. That is the real constraint. That is what scarcity means. Although per capita, real income in the United States increased 50% in just one generation, these middle class fucks have had to work hard for their modest gains. You motherfucker! According to a Fordham, Fordham, Fordham University professor quoted in the same article. However... It is doubtful whether most other people in the world would regard Americans in air-conditioned offices with coffee breaks as hard or their standard of living as just getting by. Still, the situation seemed to be viewed as not wholly satisfactory and perhaps even puzzling by the people themselves. The New York Times reported that one of these middle-class families got in over their heads in credit and spending, but then got their finances in order. And here they have, uh, I guess, the person talking. But if we make a wrong move, Geraldine Frazier said, the pressure we had from the bills will come back, and that is painful. To all these people from academia and journalism, as well as the middle class people themselves, it apparently seems strange somehow that there would be such a thing as scarcity, and that this should imply a need for both productive efforts on their part and personal responsibility in spending. Yet nothing has been more pervasive in the history of the human race than scarcity and all the requirements for economizing that go with it. Oh, I just made that up. What the hell is your problem, you jackass? 
Yet nothing has been more pervasive in the history of the human race than scarcity and all the requirements for economizing that go with scarcity. Regardless of our policies, practices, or institutions, whether they are wise or unwise, noble or in, in, ignoble, 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 no, there is simply not enough to go around to satisfy all our desires to the fullest. I'm spitting. Unmet needs are inherent in these circumstances, whether we have a capitalist, socialist, feudal, or other kind of economy. These various kinds of economies are just different institutional ways of making trade-offs that are inescapable in any economy. Economics is not just about dealing with the existing output of goods and services as consumers. It is also about producing that output from scarce resources, turning input into output. Not only scarcity, but also alternative uses are the heart of economics. If each resource had only one use, economics would be simpler. But water can be used to produce ice or steam by itself, or innumerable mixtures and compounds in combination with other things. Similarly, from petroleum comes not only gasoline, kerosene, and fuel oil, but also plastics and Vaseline. Iron ore can be used to produce steel products ranging from paper clips to automobiles to the frameworks of skyscrapers. How much of each resource should be allocated to each of its many uses? Every economy has to answer that question and each one does in one way or another, efficiently or inefficiently. Doing so efficiently is what economics is all about. Different kinds of economies are essentially different ways of making decisions about the allocations of scarce resources, and those decisions have repercussions on the life of the whole society. During the days of the Soviet Union, for example, that country's industries used more electricity than American industries to produce a smaller amount of output than American industries produced. Such inefficiencies in turning inputs into outputs translated into a lower standard of living in a country richly endowed with natural resources, perhaps more richly endowed than any other country in the world. Wow. It was much the same story in early 21st century China, which used seven times as much energy to produce a given value of output as Japan used to produce the same value of output. Here again, huge differences in efficiency meant huge differences in standard of living for millions of human beings. Efficiency in production, the rate at which inputs are turned into outputs, is not just some technicality that economists talk about. It affects the life of whole societies. When visualizing this process, it helps to think of the real things, the iron ore, the petroleum, wood, and other inputs that go into the production process of the food, furniture, automobiles that come out the other end rather than think of economic decisions as being simply decisions about money. Although the word economic suggests money to some people, for society as a whole, money is just a device to get real things done. Otherwise, the government could make us all rich by simply printing money. It is not money, but the volume of goods and services which determines whether a country is poverty-stricken or prosperous. We're almost there. Hang on, hang on. We're almost there. Economics is not about the financial fate of particular individuals or particular enterprises. It is about the material well-being of society as a whole. When economists analyze prices, wages, profits, or the international balance of trade, for example... It is from the standpoint of how decisions in various parts of the economy affect the allocation of scarce resources in a way that raises or lowers the material standard of living of the people as a whole. Economics is not simply a topic on which to express opinions or vent emotions. It is a systematic study of what happens when you do specific things in specific ways. In economic analysis, the methods used by Marxist economists like Oscar Lang did not differ in any fundamental way from the methods used by a conservative economist like Milton Friedman. It is these basic economic principles that this book is about. While there are controversies in economics, as there are in science, this does not mean that a basic principles of economics are just a matter of opinion. 
any more than the basic principles of chemistry or physics are just a matter of opinion. Economics is a tool of analysis and a body of tested knowledge and of principles derived from that knowledge. Money doesn't even have to be involved to make a decision via economic. When a military medical team arrives on a battlefield where soldiers have a variety of wounds, they are confronted with the classic economic problem of allocating scarce resources which have alternative uses. Almost never are there enough doctors, nurses, or paramedics to go around, nor enough medications. Some of the wounded are near death and have little chance of being saved, while others have a fighting chance if they get immediate care. And so others are only slightly wounded and will probably recover whether they get immediate medical attention or not. If the medical team does not allocate its time and medications efficiently, some wounded soldiers will die needlessly, while time is being spent attending to others not as urgently in need of care or still others whose wounds are so devastating that they will probably die in spite of anything that can be done for them. It is an economic problem, though not a dime changes hands. Most of us hate even to think of having to make such choices. Indeed, as we have already seen, some middle-class Americans are distressed at having to make much milder choices and trade-offs. But life does not ask what we want. It presents us with options. Economics is one of the ways of trying to make the most of those options. When India and China, historically two of the poorest countries in the world, began in the late 20th century to make fundamental changes in their economic policies, their economies began to grow dramatically. It has been estimated that 20 million people in India rose out of destitution in a decade, and more than a million Chinese per month rose out of poverty. Things like this are what makes the study of economics important. Rent control laws have led to a very similar set of consequences in... Wait, where the fuck am I? Let me start over. And not just the immediate consequences, but also the longer run reap, 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 zigga, 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 Lionel, 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 Lionel. <laughs> what am I retarded? I can't read this fucking paragraph. In other words, <laughs> now my thing might be outside. I don't even think I understood what I just said. <clears throat> In other words, <laughs> fuck this shit. <laughs> Send me money. That's that's all you need to know. Send me money. I got four fucking kids. <laughs> If you like this video, please do me a favor and hit the click button. No, d don't do that. Click on the like button and um, consider subscribing. Also, share this video with everyone you know, your friends, your neighbors, your dog, your kid's high school teacher. Um, I got four kids, man. Help me out. I got to get this thing going. I got to pay the light bill. And if you have any recommendations for books, please leave them in the comment section below. And maybe I'll do a video on it.